Imagine being told that fossil fuels are necessary to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Sounds crazy, right? It'd be like saying chocolate milk is necessary to reduce obesity or bullets are necessary to reduce gun deaths. That's exactly what Chris Wright said at a Security and Exchange Committee hearing when he was the CEO of Liberty Energy. That's the second largest hydraulic fracking company in North America. There is a video from 2019 where he gathered up some employees so they could all drink hydraulic fracking fluid on camera. That seems like a real blink two times if you need help situation. And that was before Chris Wright became the current Secretary of Energy. And the DEO just released a whopper of a paper last month. The report is called A Critical Review of the Impacts of Greenhouse Gas Emissions on the U.S. Climate. It was written by five professionals well known for disagreeing with scientific consensus on climate change. Five contrarians handpicked by Secretary Wright himself. What's the big deal about that DOE report? It argues that carbon dioxide really isn't so bad. It shouldn't be registered as a pollutant, and it's a net positive to the planet. I cannot stress enough how this DOE report does not represent consensus views on the climate. The climate science community says that the only way the DOE could have ever gotten a paper like this is to pick those five contrarians. And I'm not kidding about this. During the last Trump administration, one of the authors of this report wanted to have a military style red team, blue team debate. Climate skeptics on one side, climate consensus scientists on the other duking it out. But back then, the administration thought it was too politically risky. But how the times have changed. So when the DOE authors point out that they only had two months to put this together, I call shenanigans. This isn't a rushed scientific paper. It's a weird hodgepodge of cherry-picked facts, misrepresented scientific work, and fringe evidence that's been sitting on the shelf for years. Honestly, this paper is probably the best they could do, which isn't great considering the overwhelming scientific consensus is on the other side of the argument, the non-represented blue team. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pull out like seven dubious claims found within just like the first 12 pages of this report. And it's like 140 pages. <laughs> I think you'll be surprised at how it distorts the consensus view of climate science. So this paper starts with a whopper <laughs> and it claims that carbon dioxide should not be defined as a pollutant because it's not toxic at ambient levels. And that premise actually nicely dovetails into another recent administration paper by the EPA challenging the endangerment finding. Now, I didn't know what that was either, but that's what gives the government the ability to regulate greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. So I see the DOE report and the EPA report as sort of a one-two punch going after any regulation. The courts have already upheld several times the classification of greenhouse gases as pollutants under the Clean Air Act. So that is a fight that's gonna have to work itself out the courts. <laughs> the DOE report really tries to lean in on the idea that carbon dioxide isn't that bad for us. They point out that it takes carbon dioxide levels of 1,000 parts per million, well above our current level of 430 parts per million, to start seeing any cognitive effects of carbon dioxide. But if we were at 1,000 parts per million, we'd have much bigger problems than brain fog. We'd be experiencing levels of carbon dioxide not seen on this planet for 50 million years. We'd have temperatures 18 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they are now, and sea levels 200 100 feet higher. Then the DOE report shifts to the idea that carbon dioxide is really good for plants. <laughs> it really leans into the idea of global greening. And that's the idea that increased carbon dioxide enhances agricultural yields and is a net positive for the planet. Now the report also conveniently ignores the fact that any positive effects of increased carbon dioxide on plant growth are more than offset by other factors like lower nutritional value in the crops, increased weeds and pests and poor soil quality. And it's not even as if the greening planet claim is some kind of smoking gun. The International Panel of Climate Change clearly acknowledges that a warming climate does have some advantages, but there is an entire chapter of the latest assessment report addressing the agricultural challenges of climate change. Now, there are many scientists who have come forth to say that their research was misused or misrepresented. One of them was Dr. Ward, whose paper on the effects of carbon dioxide on increased increased plant growth was misrepresented by the paper. She has research showing the plants grow better under higher levels of carbon dioxide. Dr. Ward points out that her research was really misrepresented. It was done under controlled conditions and in no way should be used to infer that plants are going to be okay in a world of higher carbon dioxide when none of the other things were studied. No higher heat loads, no adverse weather conditions, no decreased pollinators, none of that stuff were accounted for. Then the DOE report comes out and says like the carbon dioxide levels had been going down, and if they had kept dropping, all the plants could have died. Now, there are two big problems with that claim. 
the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has definitely fluctuated over time. In fact, I went ahead and replotted data that you could get from government sites. There was nothing special about what I did. You could do it with Excel. And you'll see that even though CO2 fluctuates over the last 800,000 years, it never dropped to the point where it would threaten plant life. And I love how they show concern for low levels of carbon dioxide. <laughs> carbon dioxide levels have been climbing gradually for thousands of years and then rapidly within our lifetimes. See that little dot up there? See that dot? That's the current level, about 430 parts per million, increasing two parts per million per year. So let's put that in perspective. It took 140,000 years for carbon dioxide levels to decrease by 30%, and about 70 years for it to increase by 40%. There's no precedent for that sort of rapid atmospheric disruption. We are the experiment. And this is the point climate scientists are trying to get across. Changes typically experienced over unimaginable geological timescales due to natural activity are now happening before our eyes, rapidly thanks to the greenhouse gases we are dumping into the atmosphere. I mean, look what the DOE red team did here. Just, this is just goofy. <laughs> they took the famous Keeling curve created from the Mahualona Observatory in Hawaii, and then they superimposed danger zones on it for C3 and C4 plants. Why? I have no idea. I can only assume that they were hoping the readers might assume that the carbon dioxide levels might have kept dropping had we not, you know, started burning a lot of fossil fuels. You know, maybe fossil fuels save the plants. And remember, for at least hundreds of thousands of years and probably millions of years, atmospheric carbon dioxide has always been well above the minimum levels needed for both C3 and C4 plants to function. It has never been an issue, ever. And it will certainly never be an issue now. That is a manufactured crisis by the DOE Red Team. I mean, I mean just think about how weird this is. They, they literally made up this graph. It exists nowhere else. And so I started looking into the other figures and graphs. Almost half of the figures and tables in this report comes from those five authors, either from their own work or what they call replots or author-created figures, whatever that means. How can the Secretary of Energy say that this paper faithfully represents the state of climate science today when almost half of the figures and tables were created by the five contrarian experts who wrote the report? Does that sound like a report that faithfully represents the state of climate science? Just compare that manufactured graph to the awesome Keeling curve, uh, Mahualona's observatory's testament to the power of stable, forward-thinking, government-supported science. So it should be no surprise to you that the current administration is gonna shut Mahualona Observatory down. Not only are they scrubbing any mention of climate science from government websites, um, they're cutting programs, including the groundbreaking greenhouse gas research done at Mahualona and three other US observatories that span the globe. And check out the stuff that's still available on websites like NOAA and NASA while you still can. And I don't think that's hyperbole. The administration has already removed links to the congressionally mandated national climate assessment in order to reorganize the data. So we'll see how long it takes for them to do that and get it back up. The DOE red team is also challenging the idea of ocean acidification. You see, increased levels of carbon dioxide are dissolving into the oceans, and that's lowering the pH, making it more acidic. But they argue, since the oceans are actually probably not expected to drop below pH 7, then we really shouldn't call it ocean acidification, because that's that would be scary. <laughs> Instead, we should be calling it ocean neutralization. You know, that sounds nice. <laughs> it's not car theft, it's transportational liberation. I mean, this, this isn't a scientific argument. This is just rebranding. The DOE Red Team also suggests that marine life should probably be resilient to this increasing acidity, I mean, or uh, neutralization, because it survived mildly acidic conditions in the far-flung distant past. It should come as no surprise to you that a different author cited in the paper also uh, is challenging the way his work is being used, stating that his work on ancient oceans uh, has no relevance at all to the rapid changes caused by human greenhouse gas emissions today. So once again, the DOE Red Team has inflated gradual adaptations over geological timescales with the unprecedented adaptations needed to survive the same change over mere decades. The pH scale is a log scale. These are order of magnitude scales used to convey huge ranges of data just like the Richter scale. A change of unit of one on the log scale is actually a tenfold change. So when the pH drops 0.0, 0.017 pH units every 10 years, that translates to actually a 4% increase in acidity per decade. I mean, think about that. If that was happening to me, at my age, my blood would be about 20% more acidic. Look out, 
acidosis. <laughs> the DOE then does this really weird pivot <laughs> and says that maybe pH isn't a big deal because uh, the Great Barrier Reefs recovered faster than expected from like the last bleaching event. I think we're left to infer that the increased acidity from higher carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere really isn't as bad as everyone says. Anyone want to guess what their cited source says? <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the landing page of the Australian Institute of Marine Science, literally the front page, it leads with the headline, Worst Bleaching Event on Record for Western Australia Coral Reefs Following Long-Lasting and Widespread Marine Heat Wave. Do you see the dishonesty here? To go past that headline and then dig through their website until you find some nugget that serves your narrative. Increased acidity is not the biggest stressor for the coral reefs, it's actually oceanic heat waves. And I learned that from the Australian Institute of Marine Science's website. It's really quite good. The DOE should have like read the whole thing before they cherry picked one line from it. And as you can see from these NOAA and NASA graphs, enjoy them while you can, the oceans have really been absorbing a lot of heat. And that's a huge stressor for things like coral reefs. Hey, and by the way, a uh, huge shout out to the oceans. They've been doing a lot of work absorbing heat and carbon dioxide that we should have been dealing with up here on the surface. We'd be in a lot worse shape right now if it wasn't for the oceans quietly suffering to help us out. So I appreciate you oceans. Hang in there please for as long as you can. Then the DOE red team says, you know, the sun could have been causing a lot of this warming. And like so much else in the first 12 pages of this DOE report, this has already been refuted by the climate science community. They've looked at this. The sun's total solar irradiance barely has changed since the 70s. It fluctuates over an 11 year cycle, but maybe by a tenth of a percent, barely perceivable. And yet the earth continues to heat up. If the sun were the primary cause of recent atmospheric warming, you would expect to see more uniform warming through the entire atmosphere upper layers all the way down to the surface level. But instead what we see is actually a warmer lower atmosphere because of all the heat trapped by the greenhouse gases and actually a cooler upper atmosphere because less heat is reaching it from below. And finally, again, not to beat a dead horse here, but the Connolly paper they bring up that says, you know, maybe we're underestimating the amount of heat coming from the sun, that paper like some other papers in this report have already been scientifically refuted. It's almost as if like the report's authors didn't care, but I think you get the point. I mean, I really wasn't kidding when I said this paper was full of misrepresentations of legitimate consensus science and it platforms tired and refuted contrarian talking points. And there is no bigger contrarian gotcha than the final line that we're gonna talk about. And that's the idea that climate always changes. I really consider it like a climate denialist dog whistle. It's a way of signaling to other people that you believe that climate science is bogus without outright saying it. Yes, again, it is true that climate always changes. And that statement is completely irrelevant. It would be like me calling the police to let them know I was robbed and then they respond by reminding me balances in bank accounts always go up and down. True, but absolutely irrelevant, right? Climate always changes is just an attempt to like invalidate the term climate change and to create some kind of false equivalence between the idea of natural variation over geological timescales and the changes in the atmosphere we've done ourselves in the last 50, 100 years. There's like another 120 pages of this, but I, I think you've gotten the point. I mean, this report, it's, it's kind of shameless, really. Like it's beyond the pale. I'm gonna do my part. I think I'm gonna sit down and write a letter for the public comment. Uh, at the federal registry before the submission period ends this weekend. What's your homework? What can you do? I think you can check out some of the linked articles below. I think you could check out the IPCC website. It's pretty amazing. And then you could check out some of our own governmental sites like NOAA and NASA while they're still there. This really isn't the first video I wanted to make for this channel. I want to learn about climate science and I want you to learn along with me. And we'll get to that soon enough. But I really think I have a letter to write first. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.